A few weeks ago, Father Paul told us that if we approach the Bible expecting to find a self-help guide for living our best life, now we may be disappointed because the Bible isn't about us. He said, what if the point of the scriptures has nothing to do with the burdens and concerns that you brought with you this morning? The scriptures from start to finish aren't a story about us. They are about God. They begin with the action of God. God created. They conclude with the action of God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. This is a story about God and about God's dealings with the world he created. He didn't pay me to quote him. I just thought it was, thought it was good. Um, we tend to see ourselves as the protagonists in our own stories. But the Bible contends that the real story at the heart of the cosmos is God's story. The protagonist is our Lord Jesus Christ as he accomplishes the will of God the Father in creating and redeeming the world. Our readings today paint for us a sweeping vista of that story. In this high priestly prayer in the gospel, we find God the Son in glory with the Father before the world existed. At the end of our reading from Acts, the angels deliver the promise of Jesus returning one day from heaven in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. St. Paul summarizes the story in his letter to the Philippians, uh, showing Jesus to be the ultimate example of humble love and service in what was probably an early hymn of the church, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Glory laid aside for the sake of the world, returned again for faithful obedience and service. This is the main thread of the history of the universe, whether we know it or not. At this point of the church year, we hit a turning point in that story. The ascension marks a transition from the earthly ministry of Jesus, bodily present in Israel, through his death and resurrection, to now, as he sits at the right hand of the Father, working through his body, the church, us. In our reading from Acts, Jesus has taken his disciples up the Mount of Olives for some final instructions before he leaves them. He's told them to stay in Jerusalem and says some confusing things about baptism and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but what does that even mean? They're not quite sure. But it doesn't matter because here before them stands the resurrected Messiah. Sure, this Messiah did things differently than they had expected. Uh, he hadn't raised an army and taken on Rome. He went around preaching and healing the sick. He said things like, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, they were confused by this, but may maybe he meant those things about fellow Jews. But they followed him anyway. Because he also did the things that proved he was the Messiah. He turned water into wine. He fed the 5,000 from a couple of scrawny fish and a few measly loaves of bread. He healed a man born blind. He even raised the dead. Some of them even said they saw him transfigured before their eyes on a mountaintop, hanging out with Moses and Elijah themselves. And now, on this side of the resurrection, they finally understood that the Christ had to die in order to conquer the ultimate enemies of sin and death. But he's not dead anymore. Here he stands raised in power, victorious. He's been talking about the kingdom of God a lot. Surely now is the time when he will set up his throne in Jerusalem 
and boot the oppressors from the land. The Roman armies would prove no match for this Christ who had just single-handedly kicked down the gates of hell and come bursting from his tomb as smoke vanishes and wax melts, our, our psalm says today. And when he does this, the disciples will finally get those cushy cabinet positions they had argued over so many times. I mean, they were ready to get to work. Let's get the ball rolling here and clean things up. So they work up the courage to ask him, but, but who's going to do it? It was always kind of a touchy subject. Uh, I imagine them shoving John, the beloved disciple, to the front to ask. I mean, he won't snap at John. And, and Jesus doesn't snap. He just gently tells them that it's none of their business. He redirects their gaze. You see, he has business for them. And that's not it. Isn't it easy to think that we could fix things right up if we were king for a day? If we just had the right laws in place, the right people in charge, the right government, or you know, maybe no government, boy, human sin would be no match for that setup, right? That setup would usher in the kingdom of God. But you see, the disciples were thinking too small. They were letting their speculations and their preconceived notions distract them from the work that Jesus was actually pursuing. A political and military solution was still all they understood. They had Israel in mind. Jesus had the ends of the earth in mind. He tells them instead, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Power. Power to witness. During his earthly ministry, Jesus wasn't just performing uh, random miracles and saying whatever came into his head. He wasn't even just performing the signs that would point to his own identity as the Messiah, although he certainly did that. He was pointing people to God the Father by his words and works. In our gospel reading today, he prays, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. Name here means his character. What is the Father like? Just a few moments before, Philip had asked, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. To which Jesus replied, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. He spoke the words that he had received from the Father, and he did the works that the Father had given him to do. His very life and ministry were a manifestation of the character of God. When you looked at Jesus, you knew what God was like. And now back in Acts, standing on the Mount of Olives, it's the disciples' turn. Just as Jesus had been witness for the Father, it was their turn to be his. So even though it may not be their story or ours, Jesus wants to write this next chapter through them and through us. Their words and works accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit through them, would bear witness to his character as crucified and risen Lord of the cosmos, whose kingdom was now coming into being and would fully and finally be consummated at the end of the age with his return. We call this book the Acts of the Apostles, but really it's the Gospel of Luke, Volume 2. It's the Acts of Jesus Christ through the Apostles, through his body, the church. New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce writes, Christ is ascended, but his abiding presence and energy fill the whole book of Acts and the whole succeeding story of his people on earth. His exaltation at God's right hand means that he is the more effectually present with his people on earth, always to the close of the age. As it is put in Ephesians 4.10, he ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And as soon as Jesus says these things, he's lifted up and hidden by the clouds surrounding the glory of the Father. And they find themselves once again on a mountaintop with Jesus as it is transformed into the mountain of God. 
and the veil between heaven and earth becomes permeable. And they stare in contemplation, gazing after Jesus, as you would in that case. But they can't stay that way forever. Two angels appear to snap them out of it. Jesus is going to return. It's time to be about his business. Well, we'll have to wait another week to find out what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up. Uh, and just what that chapter of Jesus' story looks like. But in the meantime, I'm afraid to say that I agree with Father Paul. This story is not about you, and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. And we have to surrender our preconceptions and reorient ourselves around the story that God is writing. And when we sit at his feet in contemplation and prayer, as we should, we have to remember to get back up and take that healing, that inner transformation, and pour it back out in the work that he is already about in the world. Because he's already at work. He's not waiting for us. And otherwise, we'll miss everything. Remember, even though it's God's story, he wants to write this chapter through us. Regent College professor of spiritual theology, Bruce Hindmarsh, illustrates it this way. At the beginning of C.S. Lewis's Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Edmund, Lucy, and Eustace were looking at a picture of a boat on the open sea. It looked especially vivid, like things in the picture were moving. And soon they felt a wind blowing out of the picture toward them. They smelled a wild, briny smell. And then a cold, salt splash broke right out of the frame, and they were wet through and breathless with the smack of it. In a moment of confusion, they felt themselves pulled through the frame and down into the sea. And this is what needs to happen to you and to me with the biblical story. We must be pulled through the frame and into the story, left breathless with our encounter of the living God. Amen.